Hi folks, Dick Fairburn here. Hopefully my voice has made a comeback. I can get back into my series talking about self-defense cartridges. Several people have written comments and said, wow, we can't wait to see what you're going to say about the 40 Smith & Wesson. Well, if you want to hear what I think about the 40, stick around. To kind of go over the premise that I started out with on self-defense cartridges, I generally limit self-defense cartridges for civilians from the 380 up to perhaps the 45 ACP. For law enforcement or military use, I personally think the 380 is not enough. We need to put the power floor at about a 9 millimeter on up to 45 ACP. So you know, why do I say the 380 is okay for civilians but not military? Uh, really, I, I think it's in the kind of events they're likely to face. Uh, the military, the law enforcement officers that are out there, they're more likely to come in contact with those truly crazy individuals who are the most immune to pistol bullets. So therefore, I think we need a power floor of a 9mm or more. In the first three episodes of this, I covered the 380, which I considered marginal, the 9mm, which I called adequate, and the 45 ACP, which I called reliable. And so far, the reliable is the highest adjective I'll throw out for one of these. So now, we're going to talk about the 40 Smith & Wesson. This is one of the newer cartridges, obviously, uh, but yet it's coming up on 34 years. It's 34 years old this year, so uh, it's, uh, it's not a new one by any means. The 40 Smith & Wesson was introduced by Smith & Wesson in 1990 in conjunction with Winchester Ammunition. Now, I first saw a 40 caliber pistol, first heard about the whole concept of a 40, when I attended the Wyoming Law Enforcement Firearms Instructors Conference, very small in Wyoming, but uh, we did what we could. And Smith & Wesson was good enough to send a speaker out for us, and they sent Tommy Campbell, who was both a competitive shooter and a, a factory employee. And he brought with him some two-room prototypes. These were uh, stainless steel, as I recall, conventional double-action, single-action auto pistols. They had an X serial number, which I was told designates you know, a, a pre-production gun. And they were in this brand new caliber called the 40 Smith & Wesson. So that's where I first saw it, first was able to shoot one at this conference out in Douglas, Wyoming. Now to kind of further along the idea that these were prototypes, I picked up some of the brass from the, the floor of the indoor range and I mentioned to Mr. Campbell, I said, gee, you've got a, an unlocking problem here because... Uh, when, when a Browning style pistol where the, the back of the barrel drops to cycle, if it opens too soon, sometimes it opens before the firing pin has fully retracted back into its position. And when that happens, I don't have an example I can show you. I haven't saved them over the years. When that happens, you will see a little drag mark. From the dent in the primer, there will be a drag mark up across the face of the primer where the, where the tip of the firing pin is still in contact with it. When that back of the barrel drops down to unlock and, and work. And he kind of looked at me and he said, yeah, you're right, but how do you know that? Uh, and, and, and he said, yeah, we're going to change the cam angle of uh, the works on the bottom of the barrel there. We're going to delay the opening a few milliseconds to, to, to do that. But yes, it's opening too early. How do you know that? The reason I knew about the unlocking problem and that, that little firing pin wipe up across the face of a primer was because Jeff Cooper in the early 70s wanted to supercharge, hot rod the 38 Super and make it in, into essentially a semi-automatic 357 Magnum. 38 Super brass was so weak that that wouldn't allow it. If you tried to hot rod it, it'd blow out over the feed ramp. Major George Nanti, a retired Army Ordnance guy, worked for Shooting Times at, at, uh, at that date. He told Cooper, he said, hey, cut off 223 rifle brass. It's almost 
the head diameter it's very similar you can make it work but it's incredibly strong over the feed ramp it won't blow out Cooper did that wrote it up for guns and ammo he called it the Super 9 I was enthralled by that uh, my buddy Dick Heine the pistol smith thought that was pretty cool so between the two of us he built up a pistol for me I did a lot of research and eventually did an article for Handloader magazine on how to bring the 38 Super up to major level power factor for USPSA competition. And Dick Heine says that's, that's really what started that trend in 38 Super was the, the work that I did in loading that. But one of the things I noticed with those hottest loads, I was starting to get those primer wipes uh, because that much power was opening the action more rapidly than it was really originally designed for. It doesn't hurt anything necessarily, but it shows you when you're working at kind of the raw edge of, of where you should be with the pistol. So anyway, Tommy Campbell said, yeah, it's opening too early. We're going to work on that. These are, these are two of them prototypes. But he kind of sold the 40 as 10 millimeter level power from a 9 millimeter sized pistol. And that caught my eye. I really thought this was going to be a winner. Now, we can't discuss the 40 without first talking about the 10 that it came from. Again, Jeff Cooper. In uh, late 70s, early 80s, he started talking about, you know, maybe we need something newer than the 45 ACP, more velocity, flatter trajectory, but still that, that power level. And in a book he wrote called Cooper on Handguns, it's an old paperback book, it's pretty hard to find, he described his power floor, he thought, for that self-defense and hunting type cartridge for a semi-auto pistol. And his description was 4,200 1,000. No less than a 40 caliber diameter bullet, no less than 200 grains, no less than 1,000 feet per second. And they started with a couple of different pistols. One of the first ones I saw a prototype of was built on a Browning High Power and the 40 was really about as big as they could possibly go in the Browning, designed to be a 9mm. The cartridge was finally designed out. Uh, he suggested the CZ-75 pistol, which was a double single action European pistol, but it was lockable. You could cock the hammer, lock it in place the way you could with a 1911. He thought it was a very strong design. A company called Dornhaus and Dixon worked with Norma Ammunition, Dornhaus developed the pistol. Really interesting pistol. They had a lot of magazine problems. Some of the guns got out. Some had magazines, but many did not. And eventually the whole gun and Dornhaus and Dixon went into bankruptcy. But Norma in Sweden developed the cartridge. And they exceeded Cooper's desire. It was a bit, it was a bit of a spicy round. It was the 40 caliber bullet. It was 200 grain bullet. But they launched it at 1,200 feet per second from a 5-inch barrel. Now, the first time I saw a 10 millimeter being fired was actually at the indoor range there at that Wyoming Law Enforcement Academy. And even though it was several stalls down on the indoor range, you could certainly tell which one was the 10 because it was loud and it has a muddle flash. So this is a pretty powerful round. Now, after the disastrous 1986 FBI Miami shootout, they were they were using 9 millimeters and, and finally ended it with a 38 snub nose. After that shooting, they said, we need more power in our sidearms. And interestingly, they picked one of the biggest ones out there, the Smith & Wesson 1076. That's a double action, single action design, stainless steel, big pistol. Really, in my opinion, too big for plainclothes investigators, but that's what they picked. And they started out with that full power 10 millimeter cartridge. But pretty quickly they figured out that that big pistol and that hot load were not going to work for all of their agents. By this time frame they're getting a lot smaller agents, in, in both smaller males and females. So they started downloading the cartridge and they developed what was eventually called the F. 10 millimeter FBI, or more commonly called the 10 millimeter light. And they backed off the velocity quite a lot to get the recoil where they could live with it. Smith and Wesson looked at this and said, you know, if we shortened the case down and created a round with a 9 millimeter overall length and with the 10 millimeter bullets, we could match that 10 millimeter light power level 
but we could fit it into a nine millimeter size pistol. And they had a great idea. And I think it, it has proved out to be a winner. You know, the smaller frame pistol that's better for both uniform and concealed officers, but the bigger bullet and a lot of power. So was born the 40 Smith & Wesson. It is just a shortened 10 millimeter case. And the only other major difference is they switched from a large pistol primer to a small pistol primer. And a lot of people don't understand why. What, what Smith & Wesson was afraid of, if they kept that large pistol primer in a 9mm sized pistol, is that the ejector, which is usually a fixed piece of metal that kicks the case out as the slide operates, they were afraid that in the unloading process of a live round, the ejector could make contact far enough out into the primer to fire it inadvertently. So that's why they went with a small pistol primer in the 40 Smith & Wesson, as opposed to the large pistol primer of the original 10. So the 40 very quickly became the go-to police sidearm cartridge. In just a matter of a few years, it started to take over the market. Especially after the FBI. They dumped their 1076s as being too large, too heavy, and they adopted a Glock 40 caliber sidearm. Uh, Smith & Wesson brought out the 40 originally. Glock very quickly came up with a modification of their 17 and 19 pistols into the 22 and 23. They had a few growth problems with the 40. They added a second locking block pin to the frame eventually. And I don't know if it's still to this day, but when I was with the uh, Illinois State Police and we had Glock 22s, I'd say when they did their annual tear down and check of the pistol, uh, probably 25 to 30 percent of them had a had a cracked locking block pin. Uh, I, I don't know whether the pins were too brittle in the heat heat, heat treat process or what was going on, but uh, they work fine. You don't even know they're cracked until you take it out. But uh, the 40 is at kind of at that razor edge of what a nine millimeter style pistol can handle. Uh, so they're going to wear faster. Um, they may not live quite as long. The 40 satisfied the big bore crowd who says, hey, if it don't start with a four, I don't want to carry it. Yet the small caliber folks says, well, but you can get 15 of them in a full size double stack magazine. That's not too bad a deal. The grip size, the trigger reach from the grip to be able to get your finger on the trigger was the same as a nine millimeter version of whatever pistol we're talking about. So we truly did have a big bore cartridge in a small bore nine millimeter size pistol. Over the years, I've heard a lot of people say, well, I think the recoil on a 40 is sharper. You know, I've never really heard complaints. When we tested for new pistols at, at the Illinois State Police, we had to do a pre-test because one of the range officers, um, a, a lady, she said, well, I don't think the girls can hire, can handle the 40. I think the recoil will be too much. So we did a kind of a pre-test. We brought in four female shooters from the agency around. We ran them through four or 500 round comparison between the nine and 40. At one point in this, I actually walked up with a loaded 40 uh, and I asked one of the one of the officers to show me show me the pistol you're shooting. So she handed it to me, butt first was loaded. I kind of did a switcheroo and handed her back, butt first the 40 caliber version of it. And after she had fired a couple strings of fire, I said, "You noticed anything different?" She said, "You gave me a different pistol, didn't you?" And I said, "Yes, I did." What did you notice? She said, "It's louder." And I said, "Do you think it kicked any harder?" And she goes, "I didn't really notice that, but it was louder." So, to me, recoil has almost all been, always been 90% mental, not physical. I don't think the 40s recoil will eliminate anyone. I have seen some very, very small people come through the Illinois State Police Academy and eventually walk out the door, graduated as troopers, firing that Glock 22. We had one very, very small Asian gal who, who literally had to grip the pistol around on the side to even be able to reach the trigger. Now she had to go through remedial training at every stage. She struggled with it, but she beat it and she got out the door and she's out there on the streets today. So small people can handle the 40s very well. Even the U.S. Army and their elite SFOD Delta, Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta, I believe that's the actual official name of Delta Force or Delta whatever they call it, 
They swapped hand-built 1911s a number of years ago for Glock Model 22s. To my knowledge, they're the only U.S. military unit shooting a 40, but unless that has changed very recently, that, that's what they're shooting. Uh, the ammunition development in the 40 is very extensive. You can get loads from 135 grains to 180. In, in fact, if you go to Buffalo Bore or uh, some of those companies, you can even get heavier than that cast lead bullets intended for bear defense for the 40. Actually, over time, they found with newer powders, they could get even a little bit more power. So we've seen some of those loads in the 40 S&W creep up even closer to the 10 millimeter level of power. So you're throwing substantially more mass than, than a 9 millimeter load. That means it's going to do a better job getting through light intervening cover, like body metal or automotive glass. And yes, I know I'm going to get comments that, oh, I don't know what I'm talking about because the 9 millimeter does great going through glass. It does until you compare it to a 40 or a 45. I'm sorry, but if you've seen the high-speed shots of bullets going through windshield glass, they get shredded. Jackets are ripped off. Chunks are torn loose. The more mass you start with, the more mass you're going to put on target after you have to shoot through a windshield. So it's physics. You know, hopefully you learned that in high school. Civilian use of the 40 never seemed to pick up as well to me as it did with police agencies. You know, there was a point in time when every new 9mm sized pistol that came on the market, it came out in 40 first and 9mm subsequently because the 40 had taken that big a bite out of the law enforcement market. Civilians seem to either gravitate more to the 9 or the 45. I'm sure there's a lot of 40 shooters out there among you folks that, that concealed carry, but from what I saw, it, it was always more of a, a law enforcement cartridge. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details on the ammo of 40. As I said, there's almost anything you could possibly want out there. There's probably wider choice of, of 40 than anything except perhaps a 9mm. At this point in my life, I don't even own a 40 caliber pistol anymore. It's not that I don't like it, it's just that I have myself gone to either 9mm for very small concealed carry pistols, or if I'm going to carry something bigger, then I might as well go up to a 45. We saw that start to happen in law enforcement. A few years ago, the FBI came out with their, their great statement that uh, the 9mm has reached the point in development that it, it gives terminal performance equal to anything else, which is a load of bullshit. The 9mm can do an excellent job, and with the right ammo, it does a much better job than old 40 or 45 bullet technology did. But, sorry, 9's not going to be a bigger bullet in all measurements and all, all kinds of tests. But the FBI used that as part of their argument to, to leave the 40 behind and move back to the 9mm. And I was told by, the, by an FBI agent that their shooting scores went up, to the new recruits into their program were having less trouble qualifying. The 9mm is easier to shoot, no question. The 9mm ammo costs less, no question about it. You know, it, it, people talk about precious metals, you know, silver, gold, platinum. To me, the most precious metals in the history of the world are lead, copper, tin, and zinc. Because with those four metals, we make most of our weapons, with the addition of iron, but it allows us to make ammunition. And so whoever has the most lead, tin, and zinc in bullets and brass <laughs> can go take all the precious metals from somebody else they want. Those are the precious metals. And the less of those metals you use when you create a cartridge, Thus, it's going to cost. So we have seen a movement in law enforcement now that's stepping back away from the 40 and gradually moving over to the 9mm. I'm, I'm not sure that's a bad thing, but I will tell you my initial impression of the 40 was that this thing's going to catch on fire. And it did. You know, even a blind pig finds a nut once in a while, and I was right. And the 40 is still a very strong seller in both pistols for law enforcement and ammunition for whoever's got one. So that's what I think about the 40. I think the 40 is almost the perfect balance between small caliber, higher capacity, higher velocity, and large caliber, slower velocity, reduced magazine size. It really is kind of a sweet spot. So I called a 380 marginal called a 9mm, adequate. 
I called the venerable old 45 ACP reliable. For civilian use, I'm going to call it reliable. I'm going to put the 40 in the same category as the 45. When you factor in intervening cover, the size of the bullet, the wound cavities, what we see in the ballistic testing and in, in gelatin, I think it's good. So civilians, it's reliable. For police, I think it might be just one tiny step above reliable. I think the 40 Smith & Wesson is the Goldilocks cartridge. Okay, it's more powerful than a 9. Comes in a smaller package than a 45. So just like the Goldilocks story, it's not too big. It's not too small. It's just right. That's my thoughts on the 40. Next, I'm going to jump into a couple of revolver cartridges. The 38 Special and the 357. So stick around. There'll be videos coming out on those very soon. I would like to throw out also, if you think these videos are worthwhile to you, you enjoy watching them, please subscribe. I'm getting real close to 10,000 subscribers now. And I'd like to see the channel grow. So thank you very much, and y'all be safe out there. Okay, we've got them both here now. You ready? Bud got one. Ginger got one. Uh-huh. Oh, she missed it. She usually gets them, doesn't she, bud? Mm -hmm. Okay, girl. Last one. You ready? You ready? Yeah. That's all there is till next time.